Welcome to Out of the Question, a podcast that looks behind some common questions and uncovers the question behind the question while providing real solutions from a biblical world and life view. Your co-hosts are Pastor Charles Roberts and Andrea Schwartz, a teacher and mentor. Hello and welcome to another Out of the Question podcast. I'm Pastor Charles Roberts and I'm joined by my co-host, Andrea Schwartz. Hello, Andrea. Hello, Charles. Let's get to our question. Yes, today's question uh, is, how do I know where my principles come from, the things that I hold to, the things that I stand on? How do I know where those ideas and principles come from? What would you say is a question behind that question, Andrew? Well, before I get to the question behind the question, every good grade school or high school student or child who is being raised with a Christian education would automatically say, well, those come from the Bible, because you see, that's the right answer. Our ideas and our principles should come from the Bible. However, in our day and age, with the media being so prevalent and pervasive, there are lots of times we're being influenced subtly, and whereas we may think that our ideas are coming from the Bible, sometimes as a result of the bombardment over time, we're influenced in ways we might not realize. So the real question, I think, behind that question is, we may know what we believe, but do we know why we believe the things we say we believe? This, in some way, goes back to a much earlier discussion that we have had. And in that earlier discussion, I talked about the rise and influence of advertising and the manipulation of ideas and statistics to um, put people in a position to purchase items that a company or a business want to sell. I use the example of the man who's credited as being the modern-day inventor of advertising, Edward Bernays, who wrote a book on this very topic. And, you know, some of the classic examples are ivory soap. Some of our listeners may remember that example where ivory soap was no better than any other soap on the market, but they came up with this idea that because it floats in water, that used to be, we, those of us of a certain generation remember those TV commercials, that somehow because it floats in water, it was supposed to be better than any other soap. And the, the massive increase of the sales of that and other similar products based purely on advertising showed that people's ideas, if not their principles, can be manipulated to get them to act in a certain way on their beliefs. Right. And that's just an example of economic purchasing power. All right. You might say, well, you know what? If I wants to increase sales, more power to them if they get people to do it. We might be able to make that allowance. But what I'm talking about is the influence and the shift in what's important that ends up being manifested in the stories being told, in the, the music and the lyrics that people are listening to. In other words, over time, when you hear something over and over and over again, it isn't new anymore. It's commonplace. So it's like the expression, nobody is all that concerned when a dog bites a man. Yeah, dogs bite people. But when the man bites the dog, you see, that's going to be unusual. Well, as you get conditioned to certain things in the culture, it doesn't impinge on you anymore. And and I think if you go back to Psalm 119, where David says, tears go down his face any time he sees God's law disobeyed. Well, how many times in movies and novels and commercials and media, social media, do we see God's law being disobeyed and tears don't come down our our, our cheeks. In other words, we're not identifying that's a violation of God's law. That's a violation of God's law as opposed to, well, yeah, that's been that way for years. So we become desensitized to the sin. And the, the whole project of manipulating the ideas and principles of people's lives, their minds, that is the result of that having happened. I mean, there was a time in our culture where if people did not have tears running down their face because of the violation of God's law, they became angry and they did something about it. For example, in most of the towns and cities of these United States, as recently as the 1950s, 
if you were in a public place, say downtown on Main Street where people used to shop, and you began cursing loudly, taking the Lord's name in vain in that manner, uh, you would probably be arrested. There would be some action against, uh, there were blasphemy laws on the books in many places uh, for, for decades, uh, if, if not the more uh, clear ones dealing, say, with sodomy and, and those kind of issues. But, again, I'm going back to the example that I was using with the advertising. People who had an agenda to change the thinking of Christians and the Christian foundations of our culture as it existed then to where they would not be upset when God's law was being violated saw in that methodology a means by which people could be, the old term was brainwashed, into not being concerned about it. And you have well identified, you know, how this happens when something is repeated constantly, either in a song or seen over and over again in a video, whether it be the same particular song or the same particular video or the the same principles being dished out under different circumstances, different TV programs, different types of music, it begins to have, have that cumulative effect to where people's thoughts have begun to be changed. And they're no longer concerned about God's law. They're concerned about whatever the agenda being uh, forced into their minds. So you gave the example of the small town and how people had standards and they were not particularly interested in seeing those standards violated and the bad behavior modeled. Well, how did you change small town United States? Well, the great equalizer became let everybody be learning and watching the same thing. So once you standardized the public school curriculum and this is what could be in it and what could not be in it, you were shaping those minds. So forget about the fact that things might be taught in schools that ridicule Christianity. Just leaving Jesus out of history, science, and and literature, you're communicating something. So that young child... If he goes to church with his family, hears certain things on Sundays, but the rest of the week he doesn't. And so what does he think is important? Well, if you give this much time to this thing and this much time to this thing, the one you give more attention to must be more important. And, of course, your parents are sending you to these schools. Well, what about the people who are no longer school age? Well, television radio, movies are the way in which you influence them. So all you really need to do is to have a movie where a likable character just found out some bad news and he is on the corner and he is blaspheming and he's cursing and he's doing all sorts of things so we'll have sympathy for him and then he's arrested. See, that can't be a good law because we know why he's upset. So we're separating what he does for the reason he does it, and now the more we're exposed to it and the more our emotions are tugged, we're becoming relativists. There becomes a, a breakdown in the consensus of the culture to where a different consensus has been manufactured or pervaded upon the people to where they are no longer, as you said, concerned about these kind of issues. Again, I have used this example in a previous episode whereby if we can say in a broad way that the the basic thrust of the Ten Commandments was the overall operating consciousness of most people in these United States, say in the late 19th and into the mid-20th centuries, not to say that everybody was a Christian or not that everybody completely obeyed the Ten Commandments, but generally people understood and lived by the basic principles of God's laws expressed there. And most people would understand it was not proper to steal, it was not proper to commit adultery, etc. And they would hide it if they did, because that would be an example of they knew it was wrong, and they knew that everybody else wouldn't approve of it, That's so right. they would conceal it. That's why the, the prostitutes and the homosexuals were purveying their trade on a side of town that everybody knew that was the bad side, and nobody went there unless they were going there specifically to be sinful. Those are yeah, perfect examples, but that, that was the consciousness of the people. And so the ideas and the principles that people had came from that source. I mean, if you can look at it as sort of a, a round cylinder with hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, circuit cables coming out from it, connecting to people's minds, and that round cylinder is the basic principles of the Ten Commandments, everybody was sort of feeding off of that consciousness. But now that's shifted. Now, you've identified the government schools. We've talked about that in the past. The media, all of this now comes to the place where 
the media, uh, the, the humanistic status media, does our thinking for us. And I see this in churches all the time where there's been some legislated issue or manufactured crisis or whatever it may be that's all over the news networks. And uh, the people come into the churches or in groups of discussion, and this is all they talk about. This is all that they're concerned for. So their, their thoughts have been given to them. Their concerns have been given to them from the media. So it does its thinking for us now. And so things that might be issues that we'd say, oh, okay, that's an issue, but it isn't the most important issue, that rises to the top. So there are more people who are more concerned with whether or not a former quarterback gets a deal with a major sports corporation than they are with the fact that people of color and people of non-color are being aborted down the street from them on a regular basis. Because the media doesn't highlight abortion as a problem, because the media highlights it as a right, in polite conversation, everybody knows you're not going to bring that up because different people have different views. But folks, it's different views on murder, not different views in terms of what color handbag to buy. It's We're saying that people have different views on murder because our media has told us they're differing views. And of course, there's not like two equal views. There's only one correct view, and that is let people decide for themselves. And I'm glad you brought up that example of the, the Nike commercial and the quarterback and all that business, because it, uh, it, it's a good segue into another aspect of this, um, of this discussion, whereby, especially the more contemporary-oriented megachurch-type churches, you know, the, the great sin is to not be relevant. The great sin is to not be contemporary. I mean, I get that to some extent. I mean, if things are going on in the culture and you never talk about them in a sermon or in a Sunday school class, it does look kind of bad in one sense, depending on what's being said. But on the other hand, Again, it's the culture, the media setting the agenda to where this is what people becomes, become concerned about uh, in the sermon series, whatever. I remember uh, getting, when I lived in Arizona, there were lots of big mega churches in the Phoenix area, and we would get these mailers, uh, these, these flashy cards, and they would be geared to look like, say, the Star Wars movie. They were, they were clearly aping and copying something that was contemporary in the culture to kind of co-opt it. But the whole point is that they were being given the agenda by uh, the, the status and humanistic media. You know, one issue where we have seen this balloon into a major, major problem uh, as a violation of God's law is the issue of sodomy and homosexuality. And unless I'm mistaken, one of the very first, if not the first, efforts to legitimize this thinking among ordinary American people was a sitcom. I believe it was ABC. I don't remember which network it was, but it was called uh, Family. I think that was the name of it. And Billy Crystal, the comedian, played the part of a homosexual member of this a family. I think that was the first time an openly gay quote-unquote character was coming into people's homes in a lighthearted comedy type situation. And by doing so and making it funny and everything else, I think there was still a stigma attached to it, but you take a likable person and you give him a likable character and People tune in because they enjoy it. And how many people will actually look at that and say, you know, we should turn this off. This dishonors God. But with all the people who profess Christianity, I'm sure there were a good number of those who watched that show because, you know, it's just entertainment. It doesn't mean much. It, it makes me think of early television. And I remember as a kid being surprised that in early television, Moms and dads had separate beds. Right. I thought all moms and dads had separate beds. Well, it turns out moms and dads didn't always have separate beds. But the reason they had it in separate beds in the television shows is because they didn't want to too quickly overstep the bounds of everybody knew that these two characters, these two actors weren't married. So in other words, we could pretend they were married or we could accept the premise that they were married, but they went to sleep in separate beds. Well, eventually that changed, and then you had married couples in the story in the same bed. And I can remember the justification saying, at least they're married in the story. And I remember saying to people, but these two people are not married in real life. So 
if you are giving a message to your children that says sex before marriage is wrong, sex outside of a covenanted relationship is wrong, what message are you giving that says to actors who are being paid with cameramen and sound people and everybody else around them can do things which are reserved for marriage? And they go, yeah, but they're not really doing them. They're just acting like they're doing them. Do you see how the conditioning happens that after a while, when that's part of a storyline, nobody even questions it anymore? That they're not married and they happen to be in the same bed or they happen to be intimate with each other. That's how the familiarity with the sin makes it much more like, yeah, 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 so a dog bit a man. That's not unusual. And keeping with this uh, same area that we're discussing regarding sexuality, I remember when the homosexual movement began to move forward in earnest in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, many of us for the very first time heard about this organization called uh, NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association. Even if someone was slightly inclined to look the other way or say, well, I don't care what they do in the privacy of their own bedroom in terms of consenting adults, the, the idea of a man-boy love association was just totally verboten to, to most people. But again, using your example about the two actors not being married and playing that in the same bed, this is how we move forward with this same agenda in, in this area of homosexuality to where we are eventually heading in that direction if we're not already there to where this pedophilia becomes the more acceptable thing. And the key point we want to talk about here, and I want to emphasize, I should say, is that how our consciousness has changed and becomes influenced to where we don't have a problem with this. And part of our discussion earlier with Pastor Dion and the revoice thing going on and the legislation to accept so-called gay Christians led me to read this book that I've referred to previously called Bisexuality in the Ancient World, to where in the ancient world, this was an accepted practice. I'm not going to get all the details, uh, both because of the, the, the wording that would have to be used, but, and it's, we don't need to spend all that much time on it. But the point is, there's historic precedent in paganism for this very thing of a man-boy love association. The, these pedophiles, they didn't just cook that up out of nowhere. They have a historic precedent but its precedent is absolute evil and paganism. And we are finding, uh, there was a movie out just a few years ago. I think it was called Call Me By Your Name. You may remember it. I don't know. I never saw it. It got absolute rave reviews by all the, the, the humanists and, and devil worshipers in Hollywood. And the whole premise of this movie was an older man seducing a teenage boy during a summer vacation or something like that. So it, it's coming, friends. And, and the media... Uh, are the um, the engine that is driving this. And we, we need to be on our guard and be more vigilant uh, about how we expose ourselves, and especially our children. Now, racism is a big issue in the popular square. In other words, you talk about what are the things being talked about. And even this Nike ad sort of is playing on racism, that the athlete is black and he protested certain things during NFL games and now he's being promoted as somebody who sacrificed everything in order to stand for his principles. And you know what? I'm not even going to question his principles. If he believes that and those are his principles, fine. It's hard pressed to say that he's suffering because I doubt not Nike just said do this for volunteer work. I'm sure he's going to get paid for it. So I'm sure his sacrifice might be that he doesn't get to play football anymore and that's something he always wanted to do. So I'm not going to negate it. But when the race issue is at the forefront of everything and you want to promote certain things. So I know there are people who get very upset when they see interracial couples in commercials or in, or in film. And it's an area of upset. The part that's interesting to me is some people are more upset with the fact that it's an interracial couple fornicating than that there's fornication happening. So the, the point that they were trying to do, get that people to accept fornication. And so now the envelope's going to be pushed more. And we know that there are going to be people who are upset with interracial couples. And again, you can argue either side for people who feel that it should be or it shouldn't be. And we'll put this under the area of Christian liberty, whether or not 
you think you should marry someone who is not of the same color of you and, and leave that to individual liberty. But the point is, as we're discussing this, we've accepted the other thing. So why is that important? Well, if we make the argument that two people should be allowed to get married because they love each other and it doesn't matter the color of their skin and that becomes the reason why something should be okay, then when two men want to marry each other or two women want to marry each other or an older man and a younger boy or an older man and a younger girl, you see, what we're doing is we're setting the stage that the premise for what is okay is based on what we're used to and our emotional tug. Well, God doesn't say view homosexuality or transgenderism with an emotional understand what they're doing and, you know, embrace them with open arms and let's just love on them. His word says this is an abomination. And if you care about them, you won't withhold that truth. But the more we accept two people should be able to do what they want outside the context of what does the word of God say, it's hard to imagine what won't be acceptable 20 years from now. And this goes back to a point that was made in a previous episode concerning the promotion and legislation of what's been called social justice in our culture today. It goes back to the efforts of a group of Marxist and Freudian scholars who were collectively known as the Frankfurt School because they came from Frankfurt, Germany. Some of the better known are Herbert Marcuse, Saul Alinsky, these are just two of individuals who came from a largely atheistic background. And among those who have studied this school of thought, it is a consensus that their project, and they were not shy about saying this, that their purpose was to totally undermine Christian civilization. They felt it was evil, it was bad, it caused the Holocaust, it gave rise to Hitler, it did this, it did that. And so it needs to be completely shattered and something new based on the grand humanistic vision of a scientific society needs to be built up in its place. And the, the areas that were targeted by these men and their teachings and the influence that they had uh, through the Ivy League colleges and universities were the areas of human sexuality, race relations, and religion. And wow, what do we see going on today and what we've seen for the past 40 or 50 years is the steamroller of humanistic statist ideology being filtered out into all these areas, the three areas that I just named. You mentioned the, uh, this, we've talked about homosexuality, the, the issue of fornication and, and interracial couples. Well, uh, uh, immensely popular TV shows uh, revolve around polygamous plural marriage families. Now, these are all over the place on television. And so this is another part of that same agenda to where why shouldn't this be okay? It's acceptable. Well, according to what standard? Well, according to the standard of the media, according right. to the standard of the state. And, and what is its foundation? What is the standard by which these organizations and people are saying this type of relationship is okay, uh, this type isn't? You make up your own mind about whether you're going to uh, cohabit before you are formally married and, and all this business. Well, it's a purely humanistic, biblical law-hating agenda. Unless you think that we don't have religion in the schools and in the media and the public square, we most definitely do. It's just not biblical religion because anybody, and I've known young people who've done it either in high school or in college classes, when they stand up and take a stand against the murder of unborn children or that intimacies of sexuality should be reserved for marriage and that where two people are promising to be with each other for as long as they both shall live. They're laughed, they're told to sit down, and then they're accused of bringing religious beliefs into the discourse where we're not supposed to do that. Well, of course, if you don't identify humanism as a religion, then you're going to shut up. And my experience with a lot of Christians in the workplace, and I know some who work at Facebook, some who work at Google, I often ask them, do people know you're a Christian? And the answer is, well, as I do my good work and I produce excellent results, I think I'm being a great example. I said, yeah, but do they know you're a Christian? Because if they don't know you're a Christian, what are you being an example for? You're just being an example for a good worker. 
right? So we've actually backed into the closet, you know, certain things that were in the closet have come out of the closet. And by and large, Christians have retreated into the closet because they know they could lose their job. I mean, some organizations that donate money, not even necessarily to Christian causes, but to Republican causes, you have other people calling for boycotts because they dared put their money where beliefs were. Well, obviously, certain beliefs are more valuable than others. I was doing some research for an article that I wrote recently for the Chalcedon Foundation, and I came across a statement that uh, it was either directly a quote from Dr. Rushduni or something that was attributed to him uh, accurately so. And I was pointing out the fact that we often are accused by people who claim to be very concerned about the fact that you're promoting a theocracy. Is that what you want? You want a theocracy, you know, as if that would be the worst thing in the, in the imagination. But Rustuni pointed out, we're already in a theocracy. And those who listen to this podcast who claim to be Christians, you need to recognize that. If you deny the kingship of Christ, then you're denying one of the foundational principles of the Christian faith. So we're already in a theocracy. The question is, uh, what is your relationship to the king? And for people who are irreligious or atheistic or have no claimed religion, well, they're just as much in a theocracy, too. They have something that operates or functions for them as the voice of authority. And as I said earlier, for many Americans, that voice of authority is the network news, the cable news network, whatever the, the latest TV series is, that's where their voice of authority comes from. So theocracy, in other words, is unavoidable. The question is, who is your king? I think you're being too generous to say that it's the network news or it's Facebook or whatever it is. Really, the sin of Genesis 3-5 was Adam and Eve determining for themselves right and wrong. So ultimately, all rejection of God's law and God's authority is placing it into the arena of man. And so I think the reason why a lot of people will go along with things that they might find distasteful is that they want to leave the door open for their favorite sin. They're acting out contrary to God's word. And so they can't come down too hard on this group, even if they find them loathsome, because if they come down on that group, then they're coming down on themselves. And so to be consistent, not that they can be, but to be consistent to what they, what they think, their view is, well, then we all have to accept each other and everybody, you know, different strokes for different folks. And the churches are complicit or have been um, in previous generations for that very thing whether it be in the home Bible study sponsored by the church or in a Sunday school class, you know, where people sit around and you, you ostensibly have a teacher, but they go around the circle and everybody says what that particular text or that particular verse means to them. Uh, well, I don't see it that way. It may mean that to you, but it means something else to me. Uh, and, and this is just a platform for what you referred to there in, in Genesis chapter 3. Right. So I would invite people to, and my suggestion here will probably ruin <laughs> watching film and shows and everything else, but put on the lens of the Bible. So when you watch a program and there's a commercial and a woman and a man kind of look at each other lustfully as they're on you know, public transportation and you don't have a problem with that, but then... In a little bit of time, you see two men on public transportation lusting after each other, and that bothers you. Ask yourself, why does the second bother me, but the first didn't? Or have we just accepted that these older laws, like the ones you talked about, the blasphemy laws, these are antiquated. We don't do that anymore because what? We're more progressive or we have regressed? Are we better served? Because now not just on the street corner, but in the media where they will rate things because this has, you know, this rating comes because it has nudity, language, and violence. Oh, okay. Hey, everybody, let's sit down and watch it because this show will have nudity, sexuality, and violence, and bad language, and we're going to say, well, that's just the way it is. That's, that's modern times. Well, maybe it is, but should it be? Should we be saying that it's okay to watch this as a group of people and pay our money and eat our popcorn and watch people fornicate, or watch people curse, or watch people massacre or mutilate other people in a thriller or a psycho thriller. 
what are we allowing into our minds and are we evaluating it in terms of God's word? And this goes back to the very first question that we posed um, about what is the source uh, of my principles? How do I know that the principles that I hold, the worldview that I hold, as to where it comes from? Am I being influenced? Uh, am I being manipulated by, it, without even realizing it, sources that are trying to change or have, if in fact, already changed my perception to where, as you just said, I can sit down and view and listen to things that are uh, contrary to God's law. If you really want to know what people believe and think are important, all you have to do is examine where they spend their time, where they spend their resources, and where they give their efforts. And I'd have to say in America, sports is a big deal. Yes. So it doesn't matter what the athlete does. It doesn't matter what his lifestyle is or her lifestyle. It doesn't matter what they do off the court or off the field. Hey, I watch how they play baseball or I watch how they play football. And we've elevated to the point that a lot of the social engineering is that as people are watching sports, you can expect a lot of the culture shifts and the cultural agendas being promoted during the sporting events. And I'm thinking that right now the U.S. Open tennis is going on. And the name of the stadium is named after a woman who was an outstanding, quote-unquote, tennis player, but who also happens to be a very prominent and outspoken lesbian. So are we separating that out? Well, you're saying you're just so bigoted. You're, I'm not the question of being bigoted. I'm not saying let's go out and hurt this woman. What I'm saying is who do we honor? Look at who's being honored and look then in our culture who's not being honored. The Lord Jesus Christ is not being honored. And he says he doesn't share his glory with anyone. And I would add to that that this is clearly the promotion of an agenda. It's clearly the promotion of somebody's idea of what should be the case, what, ne as you said, what needs to be honored. And I'm just demanding to know, wh where do you get the right? Where is your privilege to do this, to promote this, for everybody to say, this is what's right, this is what should, should be acceptable? But if we want to promote the biblical point of view, which is the only true point of view, somehow that's evil and is bad. Well, we know the answer to these questions. As I said, it goes back to the concerted efforts of those who set their sights on the destruction of biblical faith among people in the Western world and to replace it by something that we have seen now coming into being for the better part of a century. But we know, based on what Scripture teaches us, if not what we see from human history, that these projects are doomed. They are doomed never to succeed because people are inherently sinful, and if they are not reborn by the power of God's Spirit and govern themselves according to God's law, the ultimate outcome will be chaos and destruction. We've seen this time and again in every ancient society that places man at the center of law and, and greatness and replaces God's law. Uh, the outcome is always the same. So as dismal as these things may look, from one standpoint, they are, for us, a great opportunities and great cause for hope that this entire structure will eventually crumble, and we are the ones who need to be ready to help those who are disillusioned, if not fractured by it. And the plan as God laid it out in the Great Commission isn't to take over Hollywood, isn't to take over mass media. It's to, in your area of jurisdiction and your life, that you are shining your light so that people will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, the only way they're going to be able to glorify your Father in heaven is if you tell them about your Father in heaven. And this makes it very personal, and we don't try to have to impress people with the thousands of people we brought to Christ. If we trained our children, if we cared enough about our neighbors and extended family to be a witness to the truth, then the Holy Spirit does the work that only he can do, changing people. It won't be that, well, if we just capture the movie studios or if we could get our agenda out there or we could promote Christian athletes, that's not the issue. The issue is taking it seriously and noticing when God's law is being disobeyed. Exactly. Our, our, our ancient brothers and sisters, the earliest Christians in the Roman Empire, they didn't succeed because they took over the gladiatorial games with Christian gladiators. 
they didn't succeed because they, they ran a candidate to be the Caesar who was a Christian. That's not how they succeeded at all. It was along the lines of, and exactly what you are just have just described for us. Well, as, as we uh, bring this to a close, I'm wondering, Andrea, if you have any resources or recommended suggestions, uh, reading, watching, listening for any of our folks who might want to pursue this further. I most definitely do. There is a three-volume set that was recently published by Chalcedon, and it's called An Informed Faith, and it consists of a compilation of the position papers that Rush Dooney wrote over the course of the ministry of Chalcedon. Now, just to clarify what a position paper is, it's different than writing a book. It's different than a exegesis of scripture. What he does in his position papers is he takes a particular thing. I just read one today on architecture, of all things, how architecture will reveal the religious underlying beliefs and foundations of a culture, how they build their structures. The advantage of having an informed faith is that when you encounter things that you had never encountered before, you're in a position to evaluate them, having been exposed to what would the Christian position be on this. And not that you'll agree with everything that Rush Dooney says in these position papers, but it's very useful in terms of being able to appreciate modern culture because when he wrote these position papers, he was making a commentary on various things. So some of them, he'll reference who the president of the United States is at that time, and you go, oh, okay, I know when this was written, and I know what the sorts of things that he was dealing with. But if you want to be able to know why you believe what you say you believe, you need an informed faith, and I highly recommend that you take it a little at a time. My husband and I use it as our daily devotion. We sit down and we will read it together and then we'll talk about it. And it helps us amazingly on the situations that we're going to encounter that day that we didn't realize that this would help us deal with. An excellent suggestion. I would strongly encourage our listeners to start there and uh, follow along with that. I will also suggest uh, a title in two volumes. I heard this individual interviewed on a number of uh, podcasts and talk shows, some of which were Christian, some of not. I don't really know the religious orientation of this man. His name is Neil Sanders, S-A-N-D-E-R-S, Neil Sanders. He's a British writer, and he's published a two-volume set called Your Thoughts Are Not Your Own. And Volume one is Mind Control, Mass Manipulation, and Perception Management, and Volume two is uh, Marketing, Movies, and Music. These are only available in Kindle format on Amazon, so they're not expensive. I think you can order them from the UK and paperback, but um, their main source is on Amazon and Kindle format. Very, very incisive and fascinating discussion uh, along the lines of what we were talking about today in terms of the the techniques and the agenda uh, of changing people's thoughts through um, these these means that we've discussed. And I really recommend that these podcasts, if they're going to be useful to people, will be springboards for investigation. Certainly not everything we talk about will be high on your list, but we hope that we cover enough of a variety of topics that you'll say, yeah, that's something I feel really strongly about, and do more research. Have more to bring to the conversation. So whenever someone like Charles recommends a book, the first thing I do is I go out and I get it, because if he thought it was valuable and it helped formulate some of his thoughts, then I might think the same way. And so don't take our recommendations kind of like, oh, well, they had to recommend something because that's their format. We're usually only recommending things that have benefited us, and we want you to benefit likewise. Andrea, thank you very much for those recommendations and for that uh, uh, wise insight. Uh, Could you tell our listeners how they can contact us? Yes. Email us at outofthequestionpodcast at gmail.com. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, uh, what you'd like us to talk about. Whether you'd like us to stop talking about certain things, I don't know. We're open to what you have to say. And I've heard recently from people who went on vacation and they were so glad they had their phone access because they listened to our podcast. Very good. So until our next uh, podcast, we will bid our listeners farewell. Thank you, Andrea. You're welcome, Charles. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Out of the Question. For more information on this and other topics, visit www dot kingdomdrivenfamily dot com